Hello, and welcome back to the Raw Code Academy. My name is David Flanagan, although you probably know me as Raw Code. And today we're kicking off our new course, The Complete Guide to Fermion Spin. If you're not familiar, Spin is a framework from the team at Fermion, which allows you to write microservice applications with a compilation target of WebAssembly. Now, before we dive in to the different SDKs and languages that you can write and compile to WebAssembly with, we're going to spend a little bit of time today understanding the why of WebAssembly. Why, if you are a Rust developer, TypeScript developer, Go developer, or any other developer, should you care about using WebAssembly as a target for your application? And there are a few reasons. And I hope that today's small demo will set off a small chain reaction in your mind with an explosion of ideas for your use case on WebAssembly. So without further ado, let's dive in and take a look at today's small code example on why you should start looking at WebAssembly. Let's dive right in. So in order to show you why I think WebAssembly is so important, I have put together a small sample application. Now, the first thing to note is this is not a life-changing application. This is not a production application. This is a contrived example that wants to show you how to consume WebAssembly modules across disparate systems. Because the true value in WebAssembly comes from the fact that we can choose to use Rust for one part of our system, Go in another, JavaScript or TypeScript, and so forth. Now, assuming you compile those to a WebAssembly module, they can be consumed by a WebAssembly runtime or by other languages that understand WebAssembly. This means you get the ability to explore and test new languages, use the correct language for the correct job. Maybe that Rust is the right one 90% of the time, but there's still 10% where you want to fall back on JavaScript or TypeScript. There are times you want to use a strongly typed language on the front end, like Rust. And these are all possible via the power of WebAssembly. In fact, Solomon Hikes, the founder of Docker, once said that if WebAssembly had existed, Docker wouldn't. He's saying that if WebAssembly was a compilation target for applications, we wouldn't need containers. And that's a very powerful statement. So let's dive into the contrived example and see what I've put together. Okay, first we have the domain folder. This is where we store the domain logic for our application. This is really common across most software teams these days. Domain-driven design has gathered a lot of adoption along with the various architectures which have spun out of the movement. It teaches us to build reusable components across our domain using our domain language and hopefully ensuring that you don't re-implement the same thing twice. This is often a challenge for companies that want to have polyglot teams because if you write your domain logic in one language, how do you share it and consume it in another? This often leads to rather special test cases to ensure that we have compliance across multiple runtimes. But with WebAssembly, that concern disappears. And I'm taking a domain that is hopefully familiar to everybody watching this video. Password validation. Is the password that your customer or user are using past the constraints provided by your security team across all of your applications? So I've chosen to write this in Rust. We have a constant defining the minimum length for a password of 16 characters. We have two error messages, password too short and password no space, which give us the error message if the password is too short or has no space. We then have a validate password function. Now I kept this really small and simple for today's demo, but you may have more rules in your production systems. We receive the password and we return a result or an error message. If the length of the password is less than password min length, we return an error message. And if it doesn't contain a space, we return an error message. 
Assuming both our constraints pass, we return our OK response. If we scroll down, you'll see we have a test case. I'm not going to go through it, but it's just making a few assertions against our function. What's important here is that there is nothing to tell you this is going to be used on WebAssembly. This is a Rust function using Rust types and Rust paradigms. This is the perfect example of writing your domain logic without truly understanding where it's going to end up or be used. Next, we have the WASM crate. This is our glue. This is what consumes our domain logic with a little bit of binding to the WebAssembly module. Now this first function is entirely optional, but I want to use it to show you the interrupt between client-side browser and Rust. Here we're defining a function called main, and we bind it using wasm bind gen to run when our application is started. We find the HTML DOM window, the document, and the body element. From there, we can actually write hello in your browser in your browser. Kind of neat. Next, we want to expose our domain logic via the wasm bindings. So we write a function that calls our domain function. Here we have wasm bind gen, validate password, which takes a string and returns a result or a JS value error. Next, we can just call our Rust function, the validate password function, passing in our password. Now, because our domain logic returns a string error, we do need to map this to a JS value. And we do so like this. Rust provides a map error function, which takes the original value and returns a different value. Nice and simple. From here, we can compile our WASM crate and we have two pieces of reusable information. Any other Rust service or application that we build can consume our domain crate, just as if it was another Rust crate, because it is just another Rust crate. And any application that runs or supports WebAssembly can pull in our WebAssembly module, which just so happens to consume some of our domain logic. And you can expand on this as much as you need and share as much of that agnostic domain logic as you need across all of your services. So let's consume our domain logic from a fermion spin application. I've chosen to write this in Rust so that we can see the Rust and Rust interrupt. Although I should definitely point out that fermion spin applications are compiled to a WebAssembly module. Because of that, and because our domain is written in Rust, we don't need to consume our domain logic as a WebAssembly module. We can consume it as a Rust module, which is still going to be compiled to a WebAssembly target. Pretty cool. Here we have a macro that sets up our backend function as an HTTP component on fermion spin framework. This just means that when requests come in, they can be routed to this backend function. And you'll see it takes a request input parameter. And all it expects is a result response. Now we've got a little bit of type juggling to do to fetch the body from this request, but we can grab the bytes, coerce it into a string, and then call a validate password function. If we get an OK response, we return a 200 OK. And if we get an error message, we return a 401 with the error message. Now, let me click through to our validate function. This is our non-specific, non-WebAssembly knowledge, straight up pure Rust function. So let's run our backend service. So let's run spin build followed by spin up and follow all to get the logs.
Now I provide a small hurl test suite, which we can run like so. You'll see that two requests were made against our backend API and both succeeded. What does our hurl test suite look like? One, we send a push request to localhost 3000. And the password is the full string in the code block. Password space one, two, three, space password space one, two, three. This will satisfy both our constraints. One, that it's at least 16 characters and two, it has at least one space. Our second assertion is another post to localhost on 3000. And this time the password is password space. So we pass the space constraint, but not the 16 minimum characters. And this should return a photo one. And we can confirm by run and hurl one more time. Remove the dash dash test, and we will get the output from the function or the assertion that fails. And the error message is the password must contain at least 16 characters. Perfect. But for the last demo, I'm going to consume the WASM trait. This is a domain logic compiled and exposed via WebAssembly. This time being consumed by a JavaScript function. Here, with the right Webpack configuration, you can just pull in a WASM package. So here we're importing a WASM package like any other Node.js dependency. We use a promise so that after the module is loaded, we call the validate password function and we pass it a password. In this case, password. So now we can run this front end application and see it work. We can run npm, run build, followed by npm, run start. And this runs the Webpack dev server, which we can browse to in our browser. So let's pop open localhost 8080. And first, we see the string from our Rust compiled WebAssembly application. If we take a look at index.html, we actually don't print out anything in the body of our HTML. So only by browsing to this is the hello in your browser injected. So let's pop open our DevTools. Now if we go to the console, you'll see that the password must be at least 16 characters. Now, I am no front-end web developer. To me, a good UI is in the CLI. However, we want to show a demo today. So we're going to go back to our application and modify the JavaScript code. And this time, I'll make sure the password passes the constraints and hit save. Now, the Webpack web dev server will have reloaded our application in the background, which in turn will have re reloaded our browser. And already we can see the error message about our password constraints is gone. And one more time, we'll make it fail. Hit save, jump back, and the reload we caught just in time. So from our front end application and pure JavaScript, we're able to consume our domain logic written in Rust, which is compiled to WebAssembly. And that is the power of WebAssembly. And that's all we're going to cover in this first video. I hope this piques your interest in WebAssembly and you want to learn more. In future segments of this course, we'll be taking a look at all the SDKs provided by Spin. That is Rust, TypeScript and JavaScript, and Go. We may even get a sneak preview of the new Python SDK. I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say that. After we've covered the SDKs, we're going to build some real world applications using Fermion Spin. One, a Google Analytics replacement. Not completely, but enough to get analytics from the front end application stored into a database on the back end. This should show us what a full three tier application looks like in the real world. And because we're deploying it as WebAssembly on Fermion Cloud, we get almost infinite scale 
with sub millisecond startup times for WASM binaries. And the second application we will build is an uptime checker. Using WebAssembly, we can make HTTP requests to check the status of our website. We can run this on a regular cadence and send notifications if our website fails to check. So I hope you'll join us for the next parts of this complete guide to Fermion Spin. Until then, I'll see you next time. Have a great day.